fun, and uh, let's press on and let you know what we're going to try to accomplish today. Um, I'm Chuck Kelly, and I'm located in Hackett's Cove, Nova Scotia, and uh, it's a, a wonderful afternoon here. I have with me the head of engineering design for the VS uh, series project, Mr. Alex Morris. Hello, Alex. Hi, Chuck. How are you? Very good. Glad to have you here. And congratulations on the VS series. How many engineers did you have on your team to make all this happen? Uh, right now we have uh, 10 to 15 people kind of working on this project day. Day and night, day and weekend. Pretty much. Yeah, I understand. Pretty much. One of the things we're going to talk over the process of what we're going to go through today is we're going to talk about the challenges that today's transmitter designers face. What kind of solutions are out there in the low power FM market segment right now? Try to talk about the dramatically different approach that Nautel has taken with this product. Then we're going to take a tour of the new VS series. And, and we're going to uh, test drive the new VS series as well. Um, and we'll uh, get, get your questions and answers at the end of the presentation as well. So I hope you'll, uh, you'll stay around and I hope you will ask questions um, and, and, um, and type them on the GoToWebinar question system on the right-hand side. That will be uh, very valuable. Um, let's see here. So pressing on, um, the types of, uh, when, we're, when, when a broadcast engineer is looking and planning for the next 10 to 20 years, uh, we need to compete in the IP broadcast world. There's so many competitors for our marketplace. Uh, we as broadcast engineers, both on the design side and the transmitters, as well as in, as broadcast engineers in stations, we need to figure out the place that digital radio, webcasting, all these things are going to have. How do we as broadcast engineers do more with less? Uh, the economy has been tight, and, it's, and it seems like it's going to stay that way for a while. So getting more uh, with less uh, money being spent, less resources being spent is always important. Putting the web and IP technology to work to help uh, uh, make the radio station more uh, competitive in the marketplace and to manage cost, complexity, and maintenance. And when you're designing a product that's going to last that long, those are all big issues. Let's talk about the types of products that are in the low-power FM market today. And you'll see some of the brands that, that are in the marketplace today on the right-hand side. In general, they're mostly analog exciters. At least the analog exciter is standard. In some cases, they have the uh, ability to upgrade and add a digital exciter. They have, some of them have optional or, or a minimal IP functionality. Uh, some of them may be digitally upgradable to DRM plus or HD radio. Uh, some of them have basic remote control or monitoring, basically a parallel remote control. And some of them have a reduced headroom in the, in the design side. In other words, Maybe it's, it's, it's designed a little closer to the edge in terms of temperature or voltage or current or, or whatever, and, and so therefore it may not have the robustness uh, that we've been used to in a higher power, higher cost design. And so our approach was different because those types of solutions may not be adequate going forward into the next 10 or 20 years. The not-tell approach was right from the onset to have a digital exciter right from the onset to have a very complete suite of IP functionality and to support HD radio or DRM plus to take the AUI that we're well known for now for the NV and X, and X series and, and, and implement that in the transmitter as well as to use the same types of headroom and design philosophy uh, in this transmitter as we've had in the past for our higher power transmitters. And the Nautel VS series starts at only $5,000. So we're directly competitive with all those low-priced FM transmitters. The power levels are uh, the VS300 will go up to 330 watts. Uh, the VS1 will go all the way up to 1,400 watts. And the VS2.5 will go up to 2,800 watts. So it's a very broad range of power. And the prices on those models are 5000 for the 300, uh, 8000 for the VS1, and 15000 for the VS2.5. So they're very, very competitive numbers. However, in terms of performance, uh, 
you could you would have a hard time going out and buying a uh, and a digital exciter that would provide the type of of audio performance we're talking about 90 dB signal to noise ratio in mono and composite 80 dB in stereo frequency response of 0 0.05 dB in composite the, the, the types of specifications you've you've targeted Alex are are the types of specifications that only the very top line of exciters have around the world yeah we've tried very hard to keep our uh, specifications as, as good as we can get them um, mainly trying to meet the NVE uh, specs of, that's being used in the NV transmitters. Right, and and one of the things that you did is you designed a completely digital exciter. There's no pots, there's no adjustments, it's just one relatively small card, which we'll see later in the in the broadcast. Yeah, yeah that's right. Okay, so the specifications are truly world-class. You're not giving anything up by going to a low-power, low-cost transmitter. No. The transmitters are also upgradable to digital. Um, there is another box which is being designed right now called the VSHD, which adapts any of these models to HD, and we've listed the power levels at the various injection levels here. Um, that box adds the capability for adaptive pre-correction. Um, it adds an internal XGen card. It, in, it includes the capability of drawing a true spectrum analyzer with constellation view in the AUI that's actually monitoring the RF power of the transmitter. And we'll explain why that's important. And it also adds the capability for adding HD power boost and reliable HD transport. So all of those functions um, are made possible within the VSHD, which will be available late in the year. What, you're talking about the fourth quarter at this point, I believe. Yeah, probably December. Okay. All right. So let's take a look at the back of the transmitter at the moment. The the audio, let's let's start at the over the left hand side here, Alex. We've got a couple of BNCs over here on the left hand side. Yeah, that's right. You have your uh, RF monitor BNC for hooking up your modulation monitor. Okay. And we have our RF sample BNC for um, that's basically a reverse pass sample for the uh, digital exciter that will be hooked Okay. Up. So the digital exciter when you the, the VSHD I yes, should say. Sorry because this is already a digital exciter yeah. in the transmitter, <laughs> That's right. but the, the, the HD, the HD type uh, digital exciter <laughs> connects up to this reverse path connector here, it connects up to the RF drive input, yes. and it connects up to this special Ethernet connector here, That's right. and it communicates then with the transmitter. Okay, and then here's your output port yes. on the 300 watt, that's a type N connector. Yes, and it all, it, the 300 watt is also available in the 716th uh, GIN connector as well. Okay, what types of connectors are available in the other models? Um, in the VS1 we offer 716th DIN or 78th EIA, and the same connector types as the VS1 are also offered for the VS2.5. Okay, all right. And then we have these these DB25s here. Those are for remote I.O.? That's right. Yeah. Okay. And then we have the AES EBU input connector. Yep. Yeah. And then we have four BNCs over here. One's a pilot sample, and one's a 10 megahertz in. If you're going to use this in a synchronized booster type of application, you've got three, looks like, three composite inputs. Um, one is for the baseband composite input, and two more for FCA specifically. That's right. Okay, and then these ports over the, the DB9s, it's a DB9, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> um, the DB9s are for left and right, SCA, RDS, yep. all those sorts of things. Okay. One PPS as well. And the one pulse per second for sync, uh, sync uh, booster applications. Now, this is the Ethernet jack that can provide all the audio input and output. It can provide the AUI, um, a lot of other the things that can go through that port. Yep. And then we have two USB ports, which we'll discuss in a little bit, but remember they're there. Yes. And then this is a 220 volt IEC connector. Yep. This transmitter, the 300, in fact all three of the VS transmitters are 220 volt. And if you need 110 on the 300 watt, we've got an adapter kit, if you will, that interconnects the 110 volts and, and plugs into this transmitter provides 220. Yep. So then there's an on-off switch and that's the back panel. Yes. Okay. Now, one of the things that we decided to do in the VS series is, is in, in recognition of the fact that things are changing in the broadcast industry. Many people these days are investing in fully digital studios where the interconnection, rather than large snakes of, of, of analog wires, um, are actually, the interconnection is done with Cat5 cable, and, and the typical protocol is something called live wire. 
And so there are these specialized consoles that plug in with an Ethernet jack and interconnect all the studios. And we had the thought, well, what if we could take that same technology and run it straight to the, the transmitter site? What if live wire could be extended to the transmitter? So we have implemented live wire as part of the VS series. It's the only uh, live wire enabled transmitter in the world. There's lots of other live wire stuff. There's Axia consoles, radio systems consoles, Telus talk show interfaces, Omnia processors, uh, international data casting, satellite receivers, and a pretty cool audio time manager that won an award last year from 25-7 systems. So the, 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 um, the, the VS series uh, joins a pretty neat company in ability of, of being connected up to connect up the audio via the live wire interface. We also included something called Shoutcast. Many of you may know Shoutcast because it is the method by which radio stations often stream their audio to the web. They do their webcast through Shoutcast. Over 30,000 stations worldwide, as a matter of fact, broadcast to the web with Shoutcast. So we thought, well, what if a radio station's STL were to die? What if you were able to take and, and let the VS series be connected to the web and know what the Shoutcast, what your station Shoutcast URL was, and have it be able to go pick that up in an emergency situation automatically by knowing what your Shoutcast URL is. So in a, in a, in a situation where the RSTL could, would go off the air, you could stay on the air by rebroadcasting your Shoutcast stream, and that functionality is is built in to the to the VF series. There's also an internal USB player. So we've got these USB sticks that are out there that are relatively inexpensive these days. You can buy them up to you know 32 gigabytes, relatively inexpensive. Buy them down at the Staples store or something like that, and and you can put a lot of audio in there, either in an MP3 format or a PCM format. And in an emergency situation, you could use those to play out because there's and actually a little, uh, for lack of a better word, a Winamp type client built into the VS series which can play a playlist that you have created of files which are stored on that USB stick. And there's also the ability, again, to fail over. If, if the VS notes that one of the audio inputs that your normal audio input, say the AES EBU input, is, is now um, uh, is, is, is si it's sensing silence, it can automatically switch to a backup uh, system. So um, this backup system could be defined as the internal USB player, and it could play back audio. So, okay. We also have a technology uh, called Orban Inside, which is an option now to the VS series. And this is a DSP card that Nautel has developed, which mounts internally uh, to the VS series, actually mounts on some headers on the VS Exciter card, and it runs the new Orban 5500 series code. The 5500 series is the, the latest uh, Orban 5-band, 2-band processor, and it runs the code for that, and the control is done through the AUI of the VS. So this will work with any of the left and right type inputs, like left and right, analog, AES, EBU, live wire, shoutcast, and a USB player. Uh, the only thing it doesn't work on is composite because we don't decomposite the composite before we, we modulate inside the exciter. The cool thing is, and there's several cool things, one is that it's priced at less than half the price that you could buy a, a, the new Orban 5500 for. So there's a lot of savings because the power supply is part of the transmitter. The chassis is already there. We're using the same inputs and uh, inputs as the transmitter already has, and we don't need a, a fancy display and meters because all that's built into the AUI. The other cool thing is, if you're using this broad variety of inputs that's part of the VS series transmitter, there's only one common place you can do your processing, and that's if the if the audio processor is located inside the transmitter. So again, it's an option, but it's a very reasonably priced option and it can save you a lot of money in the long term. Now let's talk about presets. Um, Alex, a preset is something that 
Nautel has been known for for a long time, and there's more than 60 presets available within the VS series. Yeah. And they store um, the frequency, the power level, the digital mode, whether it's HD radio or DRM plus or, or stereo or what have you, the audio input source and the level associated with that source, the sensitivity of that input, if you will, the RDS and SCA configuration, and the Orban Inside preset. And that's pretty cool. This is what we're talking about here is a preset within a preset. Because as everybody knows who's used a, a modern audio processor, you have presets for things like a rock format and the way that you customized it, or a, or a, a, a talk format, or a classical format, or a jazz format. You can set that up in these presets. And why that's important is, for instance, if you're using the VS series as the plus one transmitter in a N plus one configuration, then with a single button press, for instance, you have reconfigured that transmitter from one frequency to the other. You've done that by changing the preset. In this case, if you've reconfigured that plus one transmitter, that alternate uh, backup transmitter, from the rock station to the classical station, it would be a very good idea to be able to adjust the preset of the Orban at the same time. And in fact, that's what it can do. So the, the audio input failure sense for automatic switchover works to provide backup inputs. It's just like when you're booting a PC and, and the PC is looking to see if you've got a boot record at the, on the hard drive or the CD-ROM drive or the, the Ethernet stick or, or Ethernet or something like that. It's the same kind of, uh, uh, of, of progression that you can configure and you can organize. Same thing we can do here with the VS series. Very powerful. Alex, uh, when we designed this, we gave, we gave you some pretty difficult price targets. And, and I guess the, the worry that a lot of broadcasters are going to have is, okay, where did they compromise? Mm -hmm. You know, where is this not as good as I would have expected from a Nautel? Right. Tell me the truth. Where's the, where's the compromise? We didn't compromise anywhere in this transmitter. It's designed to all the same rules that we designed the rest of our high-power transmitters. It's just they're all um, put into a much smaller box with a much smaller power level, and um, it's, it's just a really good quality box for, for the price that we're selling it for. Okay, so it's easy to get out all the components and the assemblies. You have the same kind of headroom in the design that's mandated under the ancient policies, 40 years old, yes. of not tell development. That's right. Um, tell the truth here. There are some products in the marketplace from other companies that they're name branded as if they're a U.S. or Canadian company, but goodness gracious, they come from somewhere across the ocean. <laughs> and tell the truth here to everybody. Is there anything, any assemblies here, you know, PC cards or assemblies that are made somewhere else? Uh, there's no PC cards in this transmitter that, that, that are made from, from overseas. They're, they're all made here in Canada. Okay. How many potentiometers and trimmers are in this? There are zero potentiometers and trimmers. In so this it's all soft adjustment. That's right. And, and if I want to switch on the fly from, a, from 88 megahertz to 108 megahertz, how many little tweaks and gimmick capacitors do I have to there, change? There's no tuning required at all for this transmitter. It's, it's totally broadband. Okay. Now, one of the things that people have, have mentioned to me in the last few months is that some of the transmitters on the market today don't even have an air filter. And, and if they do have one, it's very difficult, and they may have to change it um, at very expensive, or they have to change it and take the transmitter off the air to do that. Can you describe what you have to do in the Nautel VS series to change the air filter? Uh, for the for the VS 300, it's really straightforward. You just um, they're they're held in by little plastic clips, and you just pop them off and take your filter out and uh, go go and wash it, and then bring it back and pop it back on. It's really straightforward. And in, in the higher power transmitters, it's just four screws, and it's all contained in the in the in the um, in the bow panel on the front of them. And the four screws are captive in it, so you, you're never going to lose those screws. And you just pop the filter out of there again, go away and wash it, and bring it back in. And, uh, well, it gets dry on. first. Yeah, probably. Good idea. Yeah. <laughs> That'd okay. be a good idea. Okay. So now, we, one of the things we, we've been talking about is the AUI, the Advanced User Interface. And uh, we're going to actually walk through this in a moment. But, but can you explain the, the philosophy of the AUI? I mean, there's no... We, we introduced the AUI with the NX and the NV, and there was this big, gorgeous 17-inch color touchscreen. Right. 
Because there's no room for that on the no, PS300. No so what did you do? <laughs> Basically, it's all available through the Ethernet jack on the back. You can you can go up to it and plug your laptop into it and get your AUI, or you can connect to it remotely over any network uh, from anywhere in the world, basically, and you can see exactly what's happening with your transmitter. Excellent. Okay, so we'll talk more about that. But basically, the AUI is a web server built into the VS series transmitter as standard, and it serves up a Flash application. So any kind of PC with a web browser that can accept Flash will work with the VS series. That's right. You may have trouble with some smartphones if yes. they don't accept Flash. Okay. Logging. Um, not too many transmitters at this power level have any sort of logging except the kind that has a pad of paper and a pencil associated <laughs> with it. Explain what you've done with logging, Alex. Um, we, we can basically log any, any uh, alarm or meter inside the transmitter and we, we, can, um, we can log thousands of events um, in the transmitter. So um, basically anything you want to keep track of, you, you can um, set up in the AUI. Okay. Now, one of the things that we talk about is the ability of the VS series to actually generate and create an email uh, if you have, uh, if, if something occurs within the transmitter which breaches a predetermined um, uh, alert status. Tell us about how that works. Um, ba basically, if you, if you set it up to um, to, to send an email um, based on a, a particular alarm or meter reading, then um, you, the, the transmitter will generate an email to, to send to you um, that will alert you that that alarm or meter, meter reading has occurred. Okay. Very good. Let's talk about troubleshooting. You mentioned that there's an awful lot of monitoring that exists within the transmitter. We're, we're monitoring all the voltages, all the currents, the fan speeds, the temperatures, all over the place. We're, and all of that is, is shown on this page and others like it. Yes. Um, it makes it very simple to determine what's going on in the transmitter. And this is actually available before you ever drive to the transmitter site. <laughs> That's you right. You can log in and see it before you leave the office. Yes. Yeah. Okay. That, that helps. I was born too early. All right. Remote control capability. Um, the AUI does have multiple levels of password control. We're very aware that um, by hooking up the internet to your transmitter, there are some risks. You know, people could hack into this thing, and we're certainly not saying that our system is totally bulletproof. But we do have multiple layers of password control. We've got the super user that can create new users. We've got the users that can go in and change things. And we've got users that can go in and view things. Um, if you are very, very concerned about security, um, you can certainly limit the VS to your own in-station network, or you could put it on a VPN. Put it simply behind a, an off-the-shelf type of VPN router, and a hardware VPN router is relatively secure. One of the other things that, um, that is part of this transmitter, that people who work in very large systems, large facilities, often ask about. That's SNMP, which stands for Simple Network Management Protocol. And an SNMP is actually a, 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 a communications protocol which is developed originally for industrial users. Um, and the definition of what all the symbols means uh, relative to what they map to in the transmitter, that document is called a MIB. Okay, that's about all I know about it. I can pronounce it. <laughs> Um, but it's at the MIB, if you, if you would like, the MIB is available from Nautel upon request. There's also the ability for configurable alarms. We talked about setting up alarms, um, but we can also aim different alarms to different people. So if we have uh, silent senses on the main program audio, we can send that alarm to the program director. If, the, if there's an RF-related issue, it can be emailed off to the engineering team. And uh, so that makes life very easy. You also have, uh, Mike Woods, a uh, very smart guy around here, been here for much longer than you or I, um, but he came up with this idea of configurable outputs on the VS series, where you've got four outputs that can control external equipment, like through a relay could control starting a generator or turning on and off an alarm system or something like that. 
via the AUI, since you already have the UI, uh, AUI. So that's a, that's a feature. Those are optical outputs, I believe, at the moment. Is that right? Uh, yeah, optical. Fiber, op fiber optic, or, or, or I mean, uh, Optocouplers. Optocouplers, right. Okay. Okay. So, going forward, RDS is built into the transmitter. There's both an RDS and an RBDS, or the American version of the RDS standard. The generator is actually built into the transmitter, which in and of itself saves a lot of money for customers, but it's even more than that because it's actually a dynamic generator as well. It can, it can handle the changing information, like song title and artist information that people like to scroll on the screens of their receivers. And the cool thing about it is the in point input to the RDS RBD, RBDS generator can either be via traditional RS-232 or you can point it at a port on the Ethernet jack. So if you've got your automation system or audio playout system in the studio, the studio is connected to the transmitter site via Ethernet, um, you can actually just configure your playout system to send the text data via ASCII, in ASCII format to the transmitter and that information will be scrolled across on, on the receivers uh, as a result of that. So that's all built in. There's also two SCA generators inside the, uh, the VS series as standard, so you don't need to do anything different. And as you can see here, the configuration capability of them is quite advanced. I mean, you can, you can turn on and off whether it's double sideband suppressed carrier or FM mode or the pre-emphasis or the low-pass filter. Everything's configurable. We also have the capability of the VS series to serve as a synchronous booster. That means that we have the capability built in to, to use a 10 megahertz reference oscillator. We have the capability and the automatic pilot 1PPS sync system in there. And we also have the audio delay built in, and it's adjustable in one microsecond increments up to several seconds. So you can, you can use this as a synchronous booster system and there's very minimal additional equipment you need. You still need the, the AES EBU linear STL to connect to the site, uh, but you, and you'll also, you'll also need the GPS receiver that provides the 1 PPS and 10 megahertz. But apart from that, we've built almost all the rest of it right into the transmitter. Looking at the backside, the transmitter couldn't be easier to install. Um, you can uh, connect up as little as just the AC plug, the RF feed line, and either the IP jack to feed the audio IP or USB stick, and you're on the air. It's that simple. Uh, there is an external exciter input provided, and even the rack rails, uh, where people like to slide these things out very, very uh, neatly on the front of racks, those are included at no cost with the transmitter. So let's look, let's look at these, these transmitters a little bit. If we can make this work, I want to show you a drawing or a photograph of the inside of the VS transmitter. This is the bottom side of the VS1, yes. one kilowatt transmitter. Yeah. And on the VS1 here, you've got four amplifiers sitting side by side here. Yes. And you've got the IPA chain here. Yes. And then as I look a little bit lower here on the screen, um, oops, let me back that out a little bit. I zoomed in a little close. I think we changed. I figures. think I did, yep. <laughs> Let me go back and see if I can do that. Go back to the other screen. Yep. Yep. All right. This is actually the top side now. All right. <laughs> Let's just do that. What do you say? Why not? Okay, so on the top side of the transmitter, here's your exciter board right here. And, and so all the connectors on the exciter are actually located on the board, yes. and they just peek through the back. Um, it's all fully connectorized, so within, there's no soldering to take out the exciter board. No. Okay. Then you have the power supply. This is the PA power supply. And then you have an interface board for the PA power supply. Um, over here, this is the output of the exciter board, which has a low-level... RF signal, right. and it goes through that cable to the RF side. And let's see if we can. Yeah, let's see 
if I know how, to get back to that other screen I was on. That's the exciter card close up. That's the other card close up. I'm going the right direction. Yeah, I think there I am. There, that's, the, that's the side we were looking at before. Okay, so there's another power supply here. Yes. There's some cables here which are used in the, in the combiner. That's right. Yeah. Okay, but I should hasten to add this is a completely broadband design. Yes. Okay, you right. don't have no, to no adjust anything or change cables or anything no. like that. Okay. There's some cooling fans up here in the one kilowatt. Yes. How hard are those to change? They're really, really easy to pull out. They're basically on a slider, so you just uh, unhook the three uh, connectors and pull it mm -hmm. out of the slider. Okay. Uh, once you have the cover off, of course, and um, then there's just a few screws to take the take the fan out and put another one in. You could probably do it in 10 or 15 minutes. How about the life of those fans? Uh, the life is they're very long life fans. They're ball bearing type fans, or yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And they're DC powered. They're power. actually the same fans that we use in the M M MV series. Okay. And they're DC powered. Yeah. Okay. Good. Volt fans. Very good. All right. So now let's do something else that's fun. Let's switch over and take a look at the actual AUI. If I can find it, there it is. All right. So this is an operating transmitter over in the lab that we're connected to through Ethernet here in my office and it's actually running right now. It's a VS300 which is operating at 50 watts at the moment and you can see it's got two tenths of or two hundredths of a watt reflected power. It's operating at 95.3. You can see now this, this is a spectrum analyzer on this Alex but it's but it's not really a spectrum analyzer. No, you're not actually looking at the output of the transmitter. You're looking at the output of the DSP, what it's, what it's sending to the upconverter. And that's because we don't have adaptive free correction in this transmitter, so we're not actually monitoring the output of the transmitter. That's right. But we are seeing what's coming out of the DSP, so you can see the effect of modulation on your programming and all that sort of thing. You're just not seeing any nonlinearities that may be occurring in your power amplifier. That's right. Yeah. Okay. We've got some meters here on the right side that we've configured up. We're looking at the PA uh, current, or the voltage in this case, mm -hmm. the PA current, the heat sink temperature, the VSWR, and the fan RPM. And the fan RPM right now is running at 6,597 <laughs> RPM. Now we can change those and configure those any way we want by changing the things that we see on this system review screen. We can look at all the supplies and the status of, of everything. Uh, and just configure those meters to be up there. Let's look at the menu system that's built into the VS series. We've mentioned the presets. Let's take a look at the configuration of one of those presets. This is preset 1, and this is where we set the power level. So if I wanted to change my power level from 50 to 55 watts, I would do that by just applying that, right? And then theoretically, once that happens, Yep, the fifth the power comes up to 55 watts. Amazing how that works. Go. Okay, <laughs> let's um, let's talk about the mode. If we were operating in digital mode, either either with HD radio or with DRM plus, I'd be able to pull that down here in mode if I had the VSHD yep. and the other associated equipment necessary for those digital modes, right. um, and it would it would allow me to change. In fact, I could have a preset set for analog stereo broadcasting and another one for DRM plus and another one for HD or whatever I wanted to do yeah. if I had all the other bits and pieces. Now the bias part is on here too because in, in, in analog FM broadcasting the transmitter is in class C but in digital broadcasting whether it's DRM plus or HD radio the transmitter is operated in class AB. Mm -hmm. So those settings, I notice there's numbers here, those just uh, configurations of bias settings, is that what those are? Or? Yeah, I think they're, they're factory set bias settings and you okay. can pick a level. Okay. Then we go to this aud main audio tab. Now currently the audio that's being fed to this transmitter is coming in via composite, mm -hmm. but I could bring it in other ways. By pulling this down I could change to left-right mono or the primary or the secondary digital input. Right. Now the left-right mono, if I pull, I suggest use that, then I can change from stereo to mono using the left, mono using the right, or stereo. Uh, I can have a 15 kilohertz low pass filter and I can choose my pre-emphasis among all the various choices there. I can also set my DBU level uh, for maximum or 100% modulation. Mm -hmm. I can also go back and set it up for primary digital, which is in this case AES EBU, yes. right? And I can do those same choices again. Um, and I can also choose secondary digital 
and that's just a, another choice in that same in the same area. Yeah, that's a, <clears throat> excuse me. That's actually the the audio coming from the ARM processor, which would be any any of your USB or your Livewire or your Shellcast. Okay. Okay. So we'll talk about those a bit more. Here is the SCA. So right now we're using we're not using SCA at all. What is SCA reduction? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Maybe don't you don't either. Know you All right. <laughs> so the composite input we can we can enable or disable the composite input on the SCA, and we can enable the internal SCA generators. And when you do that, all sorts of other menus pop up here that you can configure, including preemphasis and mode, and we can change to double sideband and you know, turn it on and turn it off. We can also switch over and take a look at the RDS. Right now, RDS is disabled. If I enable it. Then I start getting all the choices. Right now I'm choosing internal RBDS. I can choose an input in the UECP um, a protocol, or I can choose an ASCII input. I can bring in that information over IP or through the RS-232. Lots of variations. Plus, I can configure all the typical things that, are, that need to be configured, including the alternate frequency table in an RDS situation. And then as I look over here at other audio, this is where we set our pilot injection. We set the one PPS sync on or off. We set our audio delay. If we decide we're going to use the audio delay, for instance, in a synchronous booster system, I can say, OK, I need 12 microseconds of audio delay. And that's how that gets there. And we can set up an audio loss timeout. So if the existing audio channel in this preset goes away, we don't have any audio there, then we can set an action. We can say, OK, we want to change the preset. We'll change the preset to this preset or, or what have you. Um, and then, so here's where we put the dead air preset. And it can chain through a number of different presets. And we can set up the timeout, the seconds, and the threshold. OK, there's all, also a very simple, rudimentary, uh, basic audio processor, for lack of a better word, in the exciter, which is a basic hard limiter as well as an AGC limiter. If I you know, enable these things, the configuration for those comes into play, and I can look at the AGC limit and the time constants. I also have a two-slope limiter in here, very basic. Again, certainly not anything that, that compares in terms of the processing power of an Orban or something like that. But here's where you set all of those settings in the other audio section. Again, you can have 60 of these presets all configured up and then just switch them very, very quickly, and everything switches along the way. So that's a very powerful tool um, as well. OK, let's close that window. Let's look at the other menu choices we have here. Um, we can look at the system review. We can look at the hardware configuration. Here's where you set the TCXO up. Um, you can set up your audio input calibrations. You set up your external. Um, 10 megahertz input. It's also an opportunity here to do a backup of the configuration that you've got on this transmitter. Suppose I've got two of these VS transmitters. I've gone through, I've set up all my presets, I've set up all the RDS things, and I want these two things to be identical. I can actually export the configuration to a memory stick, to a USB stick, bring it over and import it into another transmitter. Save, your, save yourself a lot of time. OK, and then going back to menu, we also have um, the transmitter status. We can look at the, the status of the transmitter. We can look at any alarms which are currently in play or the meters that are associated uh, that we've configured to join on this screen, to see on this screen. We can also go through the menu here and set up user accounts. Here's how we set up the software. Um, if you look at the maintenance here, we can reboot the AUI. You can do your network setup or you set up your IP address and your subnet mask, et cetera, all of that sort of thing. You can upgrade your software. We can send you a file or you can download it from Nautel and then you can put it in a memory stick and upgrade it into here. Here's where you configure the email addresses and the SNMP server, um, uh, SMTP, SMTP yes. server. Very confusing. And here's where you set up the notifications, where we want to send something to the program director and something else to the engineer. Here's how we can upload files to that memory stick. So I can change the content on that memory stick by uploading the files. Here's where we can organize the various playlists and play out of those playlists. And actually, if I wanted to, I could come over here right now and 
and start playing on that playlist. And so now we're playing um, that playlist if the, if the software was set to that input. That's right. Right, yeah. yep. And we also have the screen where you have to set up the live wire is, is also here. So that capability is there as well. So let's, uh, let's go back here. We talked about logging earlier, but here's where the events are in that log. You can sort these. You can set some up at certain levels so that they trigger certain events and things like that. You can, you can export these as a, as a file and, and save them. Uh, you can email them to Nautel and say, what's going on with my transmitter? Not a problem. And let's see what else we've got here. We've got remote I.O. Okay, there's also, apart from all the discussion we've had about the AUI and the web server, there's also a standard complement of inputs and outputs in a parallel remote control format that virtually everybody does. The difference here is that you can configure each one of these inputs any way you want. You can make them be whatever you want. You can choose what the function of those pins are and configure it to exactly your needs. Okay, and I think we've hit the basics on this screen here. Is there anything else, Alex, you'd like to, to bring up here? I think we've covered pretty much everything. Here. Okay, all right, so let's go back to this screen here and go back to here and so to to wrap up the VS series really isn't like any other transmitter out there because it has all this functionality in it it sets it apart from the other low priced products i believe in this area let's take the opportunity to uh, look for any questions that we may have um, and if you have any questions, feel free to, to um, send them to us right now on the GoToWebinar interface, and we'll try to get to your question. First one, it says, Chuck, you mentioned the VSHD, but for DRM, is there a need for a special box or just hook up the DRM equipment directly to the VSHD? You need the VSHD because you need the ability to have the adaptive pre-correction, but certainly there's a DRM exciter and content server that is still required for DRM+. Plus. And, Nautel is actually a leader. Uh, the, the stations that are on the air and have done all the testing in DRM Plus uh, have all used Nautel equipment to date. Okay, let's see if there's any other questions. It says, oh, uh, one of the fellows has answered my question. SCA reduction reduces the main channel modulation so you don't overmodulate when you add SCA. Thank you, Mr. Neller. <laughs> I appreciate that. It's always good to have friends. And can the VS300 be used as a replacement for an older analog exciter? Absolutely. Yes. Um, the VS300 not only can operate as a huge upgrade for most people's existing analog exciter, in many cases, because it handles 300 watts, it may actually replace your IPA if you've got one as well. And uh, we've done a lot of work to make sure that the transmitter is going to be very robust in that environment. Um, <laughs> There's a question about um, partnering with alternative audio processor manufacturers. Uh, thank you for that question, and I will try to handle this. Yes, absolutely. If you have a group of broadcast engineers in a room and you ask about the best audio processor, half of them are going to say one and half of them are going to say the other. And we have had a number of discussions with all major audio processor manufacturers, and there's nothing to keep us at some point in time in the future of including somebody else's product in the box. We just, this is what we happen to come to the finish line with first. Thank you for that question as well. Um, let's see here. There's another question. Okay. It says, um, it says, I noticed that the date on your AUI is Saturday, March 12, 2012. <laughs> is that the premonition of the end of days? <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, no, it's, it's an indication that somebody didn't set the clock properly, actually. <laughs> Good question. All right. Uh, the next question is, uh, when will this line start shipping? Alex, <laughs> over to you, buddy. So the, the VS300 is uh, scheduled to start shipping on April 12th. Uh, the VS1 is scheduled to start shipping on April 21st. 
and the VS two and a half is scheduled for June thirtieth. Okay. Now, despite the fact that this is the introductory webinar, um, the sales department has been quite busy, and we already have about two hundred of these things sold. So, um, but we can make plenty. Don't worry. <laughs> um, we will. Uh, we will be. I, I think right now, if you place an order today, you could have and a VS 300 within 30 or 45 days without a problem. All right, so I hope that answers that question. That's all the questions that I see here. I will answer one question that came up uh, earlier uh, in the previous webinar that I, that I wanted to answer here as well, because it was a good question. The, the, the fellow was interested in the, in, the, in the synchronous booster capability of the VS series and wanted to know if I'm setting up a synchronous booster system, do I need to have a VS on both ends, or can I use my existing transmitter for the main transmitter and the VS as the booster? And the answer is, you probably are going to need to take a VS and you replace it as the exciter in the main transmitter, because otherwise you may not have the capability of synchronizing the carrier and, and the pilot phase and everything to GPS. If your exciter has that, wonderful, you're great, but most of them don't. So you may need to replace the exciter in, in your main transmitter and then use the VS um, as, the, um, as the booster transmitter as well. And let's see, it looks like we may have got another question here. All right, this question says, um, let's see, the, does Nautel think of going up to 5 kilowatt power soon as most of the private stations here in Nigeria are limited to 5 kilowatts max. I think this would be the best system for this part of the world. Thank you for logging in from Nigeria, Asim. Um, we, we are always talking about various different power levels. I can't commit at this point in time to anything specifically, but if the market wants to have a low-priced FM transmitter in the 5 kilowatt range with the feature set that the VS has, I have no doubt that we will listen to the marketplace. Um, what are the functionality differences between the VS and the V-series? Alex? <laughs> the VS and the, I, don't, I don't really have... I'm a sorry, I said VS and I think it's the VS and the N-V-series. No, he says V-series. Okay, well, there's huge differences. Um, first off, the, the V-series is a much broader product range that goes way up in power. Um, in terms of RF capability, they're similar. Uh, in fact, the amplifiers are very similar. Yeah. Um, but all this IP functionality, that sort of thing, is not available in the V-Series. The exciter in the V-Series is the M50, which is a great exciter, but it's way more expensive than even almost any of these boxes, just as an exciter. Um, if we're comparing with the VS-Series, very, very similar. The main difference is you don't have a 17-inch uh, color touchscreen on the front. <laughs> and, and the modularity. The, the, these are, even though these RF amplifiers can come out and, and be replaced very quickly. It's not just simply pulling it out from the front of the transmitter as it would be in the MV series. That's right. Okay. And uh, let's see. It says, I missed the first 10 minutes. Will the webinar be available online for viewing later? Actually, yes. Um, probably early next week, I suspect, with the holiday coming up, um, our very capable Ian Burns will uh, truncate and get rid of all the ahs and ums and uh, pops and glicks and errors. And, and put this up on the web, and it will be available at www.nautel.webinars. And, uh, and all the old, um, older, even last week, um, uh, webinars that we've done on a number of different subjects are available there as well. Okay, I do think we have, uh, we have finished up all of our, um, our uh, questions now. I want to thank everybody for participating. Alex, I want to thank you and your team and congratulate you and your team for the outstanding work on this very, very exciting product. I want to let everybody know that if there are additional questions, you can email them to us at sales at nautel.com. There's the information on the webinar archive. Um, and you can also contact any of your favorite Nautel sales representatives in any part of the world that you may be we're ready to help. Everybody have a, have a wonderful holiday weekend, and thank you for participating in this Nautel webinar. Bye-bye for now.